I was lucky to have my both parents all through my life, you know, up, up until now. So I've always had a roof provided over my head. Um, but there was a time I wanted to run away from home so bad um, because no one understood me. And I think the most difficult time in my life was not... Yeah, there was poverty at some point because my parents... But that's my parents' story, not necessarily my story. But then looking at that, there was a time when we lost everything. We turned out of our home, we moved into an, uh, a family friend's house that we had no louvers, no windows and stuff. But we stayed in there and we sent away from there again. And then there was this time I was coming home from school. I'm sure nobody in my secondary school ever knew this, but uh, it did happen. And um, my mom had said to go stay with my cousins so that I would not know how bad it was at home. So I'd gone to stay with my cousins, but then my dad had come to pick me that no, he would come home. So I went home and home was a shack. I couldn't sleep. I cried all night. I think that was one of the things that made me say, you know, no matter what, I'm not going to find myself in that situation. Nothing was going to ever make me feel that bad again. I would do what it like. But I don't even think it made me feel so bad because it just made me realize like, there's no other place to fall to. I've slept in a shack. Um, so it couldn't be what this was. So it couldn't get much worse. So even if I have failure in my life, I know how to deal with failure and I still know how to get back up. So that did happen and then my mom was so pained. I couldn't cope with it. I'm the only girl, so it was really painful. I've lived in houses. I grew up boiling, and then to get to that point, I've lived, my dad, we used to, have, we used to live like on an estate where we had like 12 rooms, three, four parlors, to so everybody in one tiny room. No bathroom, no kitchen. <sighs> well, I don't want to remember that too much, but um, it did get that bad growing up. And then, of course, once my parents, you know, things got better a bit, but I would always appreciate my parents for one thing. Like, it never affected our education. I went to the very best of the schools that they could. I mean, in Nigeria, the only reason I went to Yabatek was because Yabatek was the only school that had solid fashion at a higher education level. And my parents did not want that for me. And my parents paid all my fees, regardless of whatever they had to go through. So I'm forever, forever, forever grateful for their sacrifice for me and my brothers. Um, but knowing that that was possible, that could happen, made me work extremely hard, made me throw everything I had into my classwork, into my internships. And maybe some people just wondered, why did she work so hard? Right? Why did she work like she had a devil on, there, on her back? It's because I know what poverty was like. And then by the time I started working, of course I biked a lot, you know, and took buses, but after, I was working at Tiffany Amber, I had, it was a good position, like it was a dream job for most young people. So, because I was, not to blow my trumpet, I was really cool at my job, I rocked. So, I was given an apartment in the new room. We had an official car driver. So for, I was boiling, like that was like the height of what you could want for a Nigerian schooled designer, I mean. And you're working at one of the best fashion houses in Nigeria. So what else? We traveled, I went to New York, I went to South Africa, I went to Kenya. After two years, I just woke up and said, you know what? I wasn't going to, I knew I wasn't going to get a promotion higher than what I had. And I had a discussion and it did come up like, okay, so where do you want us to, what, what, what position do you want us to give you or what? And then I just thought it was time to face, to, to go do my, to pursue my own dreams. So I, sent him a resignation letter and funny enough in my account I had nothing. Yes, I had a good job but the pay wasn't much. Uh, I had a fantastic lifestyle but I spent it all trying to be the island girl. So I took cabs everywhere, went to the movies, went clubbing at weekends. You know, I, I, I was an MI groupie so everywhere MI was performing I would show up with my friend. So, I had a fantastic young girl's life, but then I just realized that, come on. My friends that were working in the bank or in the oil industry already started buying their cars, even if it was with loans. And I'm like, in five years time, if I continued on this part, will I have what they have? Or will I have the self-worth or self-respect? I think when somebody snubbed me at the mall, 
a classmate of mine. I was working, I was doing the window display in the sh office shop, the Fnyamba shop in the mall. And she was with her friend, she worked at LNG. And she, was, she just wouldn't look me in the eye and she just wouldn't say hi because I was working for somebody else and it wasn't a prestigious job like hers. I was so pained, like I was burnt. Like, what? So that about like, so am I, am I always going to be seen as the help? When is this going to stop? So that just made me pack up my bags. With 40,000 naira in my account, I moved back home to my room, cleared it out, put some furniture, built a table, stool, got a small computer. That was my office space. So I started sleeping on the floor again. <laughs> and that was my first office. And from that office with 40,000 naira, a sewing machine, the Ghana was go of pieces that I'd gathered all for years. Adrian Mustafiri was birthed March 1st, 2010. And seven years down the line, here we are with uh, three shops of our own production house and over 15 stockists. So it's been a tough uphill climb, but it's been very rewarding. Very, very rewarding. My name is Ejiro Emostafiri. I'm a fashion designer and a fashion entrepreneur. I'm young and really blessed to believe in my dreams.